All right, and now it's time for Elizabeth Wicks. And right, so Elizabeth will be speaking to us about recontextualizing humanities skills for coding. Hi there. So I want to start off with to say that all the slides are actually up on Figshare. Um, I tweeted the link earlier if you want to look through the hashtag. Uh, this is also based off, this is a very short remix of a workshop presentation I went, I did as well, which is also linked on Figshare. So, does the clicker work? It does. Ooh. <laughs> so, this card is from a game called Cards Against Librarianship. It says, sobbing quietly while learning to code. So, the very fact that this card exists tells me that we need to have a conversation about this. <laughs> so let's have a bit of that conversation. I don't want to go too far down the emotional rabbit hole <laughs> of coding and what it means to learn how to code. But at the same time, if we don't talk about that, if we don't talk about what it's like to learn how to code when you're not used to it, you're just going to want to set things on fire. <laughs> so we need to be somewhere in the middle of like poor Lisa dealing with like Let's talk about, oh, it didn't, here we go. Uh -huh. So we need to be there somewhere in the middle between poor Lisa here listening to, like, let's talk about our feelings about algebra and the boys setting the bookmobile on fire. So <laughs> this isn't a talk defending on why you should learn how to code. I believe that's next. Uh, this is a talk on how to learn how to code when you're not coming from a STEM background. So who isn't from STEM in your undergrad? English, history, literature, all of that awesome stuff. Who is actually STEM? <laughs> so given that this is a library school, the vast majority of our students are coming from non-STEM th things. And yet, we're being told, learn all the tech skills. All the computer things are awesome. And it's like, yeah, OK, we used to buy into that. But that doesn't make it necessarily easy for us to get into this whole new domain. So, yeah, as I said, most of us aren't from STEM. I'm from social sciences, so I'm kind of not entirely pure humanities. So I'll vary between saying you and we about humanists. <laughs> um, most programming materials are designed for people who have a STEM background because they're for CS students. You're going through a structured four-year program. We are a smaller audience. We still need to know those things. <laughs> but we're a much smaller population, and so it's unrealistic to expect that we would ever have large-scale buy-in to publishers creating these kinds of materials. They do exist, though. They totally are out there. Uh, but for now, it's going to be something that we just have to live with and work around. So how do we do that? Um, let's back up a little bit and talk about this concept of education and the bachelor's degree. Uh, and the act, the very act of going through an under undergraduate education program means that we're specializing our learning skills. We're like not only learning about literature, we're learning how to learn about literature itself. We self-select into majors and interests that speak to us and speak to our framework of the world. So we're not entirely unbiased. And then we're not entirely being created whole cloth by these majors but it does influence us. So this is a tiny transcript of a very awkward date that I had, not with my husband. <laughs> so I was explaining to him, I'm from sociology. I love it because everything is in the gray area. There's no real single right answer. You just come up with a position. You find support for it. You justify it, and you go with it. And he was like, whoa. <laughs> Don't, isn't it really hard to like do something that doesn't have a right answer? And this is like this concept was like making like visibly uncomfortable. And uh, my reaction was like, don't you find it restricting that there's only ever one right answer? And so we went back and forth, and it didn't go very well after that. <laughs> so the further we get, so we're in a graduate program, right? So some of us are maybe a year to many more years out of undergrad. So. A lot of us kind of forgot that we had to learn how to do these things. Like, how many people remember how to, learning how to write a citation? Do you remember that moment? I don't. I 
I just know that I always could. Like riding a bike. I don't remember learning. <laughs> like, uh, the higher we get and the further we get into these domains, the more we specialize and the more we kind of forget that beginning part. Until we move into a foreign domain. And this idea of relearning things and learning a new domain becomes incredibly clear to us. Those with learning disabilities pretty much know this from all of the time. You can't forget that you're trying to learn how to learn things. Uh, so moving into a foreign domain, after going through an advanced program of something else, uh, makes, not always, but usually there's sort of a lack of learning schemas for how to learn in that area and learn in that domain. It's not that we aren't skilled enough, it's that we don't know how to learn in that domain. And that's a new skill that we also have to learn before we can be successful. So, big question, how do humanists fit their current skills into learning how to write code? Because you do, you have them. You may not be able to see it very clearly, and that's the point of what I'm going to go into next. So, let's talk about a very broad analogy of writing a program as writing a research paper. So, if you think about this concept of an essay or a research paper, you have like a thesis statement of the main thing you're trying to argue. And the body of the paper is going to be your very supporting evidence for that, kind of proving your opinion or finding other researchers who have found support for it. Then you tie it all in together in a conclusion statement and you turn this object into your professor. Um, it's an object because, you know, new forms of education. Um, <laughs> so, when you're writing a paper, you might be writing something short, very, very to the point, reaction essay. Uh, you get in, you make your point, justify it, you get out. 500 words. So, it's a very, very simple direct task. Make this into that. Uh, on the other hand, you might be writing something like a term paper or a thesis, where you're trying to make an incredibly nuanced point, where you have like, a really deep thesis statement that takes you a long time to un not only unpack, but find all of the nuanced sources to support that. You need to handle a lot of differing opinions, a lot of criticisms as you're doing it, and it becomes very, very long. And programs aren't that different. So let's take a very classic program, like write a Fahrenheit to Celsius converting program. Well, your thesis statement is, I will convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Your supporting evidence will be answering the following questions. Are these units compatible? What's the formula for that conversion? And are there established community mechanisms to do this? And when you wrap it all up together with all of your transition statements and all of the conclusion statements and the final output, that's your program. It's exactly the same as writing an essay. The other thing you guys are already used to is this iterative process of writing a paper. So think about the last paper you wrote. Did you write it absolutely from start to finish beautifully? <laughs> Did you like start it at 9 p.m. and you're like, I'm going to do this 10 page paper tonight and it's going to be awesome. And like, you just sat down there with your coffee and you typed until 1 a.m. and the most beautiful and perfect paper came out from perfectly from left to right and you deleted nothing. <laughs> and that doesn't happen. This is why we outline. <laughs> so when we're writing a paper, we start with this thesis statement, we do some research. If we can't find support for it, maybe you have a think huh, uh, I'm going to go a different direction. And you iterate, and you trash, and you burn, and you try, and you practice. And you tweak it, and you proofread it, and then it's done. And you go over the same document or object many, many times. Writing program is no different. You, s you have this general problem of like, okay, Fahrenheit to Celsius, that seems plausible. Uh, you do some research, and then you find out, well, is that, in that case, it totally works. But there are some units that are like more opaque to convert between them. Yeah, and you get find support, you implement them, and you make your deliverable, and you rarely ever write it perfectly from start to finish. I've only done that a handful of times, and it's on things that I've already written like 10 times before. Yeah, so nothing is written from start to finish. Unless you're a crazy genius, they all exist. We have the right to hate them. <laughs> we outline, and that's the purpose of an outline, is to sort of like look at your flow of thoughts, does this make sense? Is this creating a cohesive argument? Programming is the same, and you write, it's called pseudocode, as you're sort of writing the outline of your program. Critical passes are very necessary, and humanists, I think, those who particularly who studied logic, are in a very unique position to be very critical 
about your code. Like, have I written this conditional statement and left gaps? Are there any other things that I need to be talking about this? I think you guys have a great perspective to kind of critically analyze your own code and your own logical structure. And of course, sometimes you just need to give up. Whack against the same thing for two hours, give up, go to your car, as soon as you touch the door handle, you're like, oh, that way, okay. I'll fix that later. So critical feedback is your friend. There's sort of the, almost this like one pass mechanism in sort of like the liberal arts coursework where you do your reading, you listen to the professor, you ingest all of those things, you have a good think about it, you produce this document or object, you turn it in and you're like, ha, ah, I'm done with that. Uh, and then you get sort of this like single time revision <laughs> and, and feedback from your professor. Uh, programs will be a bit more noisy <laughs> than just one time. Um, programs will yell at you sometimes in not ways that are always helpful. And we need to look at those syntax failures, not as the program, not as Python telling you, I have judged your soul and found it wanting. <laughs> it's just trying to tell you that whatever it was, it didn't work. It's not always going to be a helpful thing. It's just telling you, uh, something went wrong. Uh, can you please maybe check line six? And you need to get this idea of drill and practice. Like, think back to your math classes. It might totally be high school. And that's totally fine. If you can balance your checkbook, you can do basic programming. You're good. Um, but you have to practice. You have to drill. You have to think about the logic you want to write and have the syntax come out of your fingers. It's the same thing as learning any language. So. When we're writing these papers and we turn them into our professors, we expect this critical feedback of like, I might go home and cry, but right now I'm staying strong and it's going to be fine. And like, I feel helped even though I'm really angry. And like, and those are totally normal feelings that we're used to and we accept. That's the reality of education, right? And yet, why do we look at error messages coming in from our programs as like, Ugh, I'm done. I'm never again coding. You know, it's, it's trying to tell you the same thing if less helpful or grammatically correct. So there's also a task that everyone does, spell checking. So let's take a look at how spell checking can be applied into this idea of debugging. So we were typing up our fantastic paper at 9 PM with our fourth cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, you look at the bottom of Microsoft Word, and it's got that lovely red X. You're like, oh, OK, something went wrong. It's probably just my genius. <laughs> um, you go, and you find the error, right? And you look at that word, and you're like, did I type the letter Z instead of A? No. OK, so you find it, and you're like, you look at the particular word, and you're like, did I typo that word? Did I clearly misspell something here? And if not, you brought in your context, right? You look at the words around it. Like, oh, did I use the wrong version of the word? And if you're like, no, that seems plausible, but it's still yelling at me. I don't know what it wants. <laughs> you look even broader out, and you ask yourself, did I actually say the thing I wanted to say? And you make some sort of correction, or you tell it to shut up, because nothing knows that the word curation exists. <laughs> and you make some sort of correction. Debugging is the same way. Python's going to yell at you and say, like, line six, yo, take a look. It might not even mean line six, because you might have jacked it up on line five. And it's just like, I didn't mess up until line six. I don't know what you wanted. Um, so you look at your spelling of the word. Did I spell strip as stripe? You know, you look at your punctuation, you look at your containers, you look at your white space, and you make sure that you said what you wanted to say. And so in what I just described about debugging a program, if I didn't say I was debugging a program, would that have been a plausible statement to say about writing a paper? I think so, <laughs> in some context. So be OK with not knowing, again, how you're going to get to the end, right? When you're writing a poem, do you always know what the final line is going to be? Should you know that that final line is going to be? I don't know. Part of the creative process is sort of as you're writing the characters and as you're putting everything together, an important part of that process is to just let it go and let it go where it needs to go. And you'll revise and you'll do your thing. But you won't know where you need to be until you start getting there. Which leads me into this concept of necessary uncertainty. So. You need to plan 
Planning how you can do something is often impossible. Focus on planning that you will accomplish something, <laughs> not how you will do something. Because very often, like, you can't know how to wrangle the data in a data set until, like, literally you open it, right? <laughs> so you don't know the structures. You don't know what it's going to complain about. You don't know if the researcher was like, I just paste all the things in from Excel and, like, I jacked up the columns. And you have no idea. So the basic procedure to approaching a program is you're going to receive some sort of input, like your data. Something magical happens <laughs> that you do. You have your genius moment. And then profit of output. <laughs> your deliverable happens at this point. So in particular, when you're, a more defined version of this is you sort of, you take a look at your inputs, you sort of figure out like what sort of magical things need to happen to them. And then you have to think and you sort it out and you make a battle plan or an outline. You do those things and then you have this glorious output that you turn in and you get an awesome grade on. So now I'm gonna talk to library speak. Know your reference materials. So we're all cool with using a thesaurus and a dictionary, MLA style guide, Purdue's OWL. I love, thank you, thank you, Purdue. So we're used to that. That's a normal process, right? Looking at the documentation for the language that you're using and for the tasks that you're doing is the same thing. It's not cheating. It's not the kind of thing where like, you read, you listen, you have your think, you go to your exam. It's not that way. You read, you listen, you have your think, but you reference. Every programmer has a huge bookshelf. Dave Dubin's is glorious, just to say. It's also color-coded. <laughs> um, it's not this sort of like boom, 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 deliverable kind of thing. You reference, and you have to know what to use, when to use, how to find things. You almost have to be an information professional. I just gave a talk on Thursday about how programming is an information-centered activity. And I would love to nerd out with you about that later on. So have your favorite reading materials available and use them. And don't ever feel bad about using documentation. And I'm going to end with some general tips. So as you're sitting through this lecture, it's a very different kind of lecture that you're going to have in your programming or tech classes. Some people will try to focus on, like, I'm going to write down every single word in that slide, because the like, teacher might have 30 different functions on the slide. Don't copy them down. You'll be fine. <laughs> That's not where you need to be expending your effort. Um, as you're listening to these lectures, as you're reading these books, listening to talks online, focus on remembering concepts over syntax. Because you can always look up something later, so long as you remember that it exists. So if you're coming to this problem, you're looking at this data set, and you're like, it's coming in with crazy new lines, and I hate them, but I need to make them go away. Oh, there's a thing for that. So Google, Python, remove new lines. OK, there we go. Strip. <laughs> Done. You know, and so the, you didn't have to remember the name of strip or their arguments or how to use it. You just had to remember, there's a thing to do that. I'm going to go look it up in the documentation. Uh, practice your words. Use them. Like, you can't ask a question if you don't have the words to describe what you're asking you're not going to get a very good answer if you're not asking something that's real. So, and the biggest hurdle of learning in programming stuff is to discover these words and how to use them canonically for that community as well. Because every community is different as well. Like you're going to have different names for the same structure in Python versus Java. They're going to be different. Those are fighting words to other people. But, you know, <laughs> synonymously to beginners, they're like, that's a key value pair. So it's a dictionary, right? And they're like, it's a map, thank you. Uh, so, as you're using these words with a mentor or a colleague, uh, ask for feedback and be corrected. And be corrected gratefully and gracefully as well. Like, we're trying to help you. And as with my students, I'll try to like, like, I hear you said this, but I'm going to shift that maybe to this other word that's more correct. In the sense that, that me correcting you is trying to help you later ask a better question. So again, look at the documentation. I can't say that enough. It's not cheating. So many, even the CS kids think it's cheating sometimes. It's not. It's reality. Um, there are different kinds of reference works in this world than we're used to, I think. Um, they don't really have like thesauri like we do, <laughs> but they have cookbooks, which are awesome and neat. Uh, so you should take a look at those. I have a talk, lightning talk from last semester up on YouTube about that. Um, Find a cohort, find a group of people, find that person 
you know you can go to and you're like, I'm going to ask a stupid question and I'm going to use the wrong words, but you're going to listen to me because you love me and you're going to help me. So like, find that human and I will be that human if you don't have one otherwise. <laughs> um, eventually you're going to get sick of it. Eventually you're going to hate it. <laughs> eventually you're going to be like, the next person who says Python to me, I'm going to stab in the kidney. And that's going to be a very natural and normal feeling. Um, and if you think you're going to spend 40 hours during spring break studying Python, you're not. And you shouldn't, and it's a bad idea. So have something else. Because there's a lot of technical dependencies to coding, so there's going to be always something else you need to be studying. So when you get sick of it, you move on to something else, take a break. And that's totally fine. So uh, as I said, slides are up on Figshare and tweeted, and I'd love to chat with this more. So thanks. Any questions? Yes, I just wanted to, to mention that Martin, one of our virtual participants, said that um, he thought it was a really great comparison. Thanks. <laughs> As a former history major, I agree. <laughs> hey, this is Kate McDowell, Gisla's faculty and assistant dean. Um, Elizabeth, this is fantastic. And this time of year is the time of year when I tend to see a lot of people in my office who are stressed out, sometimes crying, because they may have done this thing that we all do at some point or another, and it's really hard to unlearn, and it's called procrastinating. And I just noticed that one of the, so I'm thinking about where the metaphor holds and where it's more complicated. And I wanted to pull out procrastination and get your feedback in terms of where you see the complexity, because I certainly, just from what you've said so far, a key piece is that you can't put this off until the last minute, right? As tempting as that is. And I think yeah. that's something that's hard sometimes for humanities scholars, and I'm, I'm myself included in the past, is that I have gotten away with a lot of stuff that I put off to the last minute. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like, but I'll tell you where it fell down for me was the dissertation at the PhD level. You can't do it. You, you can't. It's not possible. Um, I, I actually tried. I had, I think, you know, Boyd's been gone a while now. I don't know if Alan even knows this, but I had an entire draft of my dissertation completely rejected. And Boyd said, no, scrap that and start over. And he was right, because what I tried to do is what I'd always gotten away with, which was do it all at once. And there was some interesting stuff in there that I managed to make into an actual dissertation later, but that first draft was a hot mess, like a, a total hot mess, because it's just too big. So I wondered if you could talk, I'm just, I'm just sort of sharing a little bit here about that experience, too. And Listen, everybody needs to know, failure is not the end of the road, right? It's just, it's just a step. I was you hearing some of that from the earlier session. It's just a step along the way. So I wonder if you could, if you have any thoughts from your teaching about when you see people who've had that, have gotten away with a lot because of procrastination, like I used to do, who've had, and I don't necessarily, I'm not asking for the emotional rabbit hole, I'm asking more for the strategic yeah. ladder, like you how do you scaffold like, that? You can't yeah. get away with it. Right. Um, and it, it's baffling because you're like looking, you, you, you kind of like whack through this first problem and you're like, I spent how many hours of my life on five lines of code, and you're like, how long is it going to take me to write five lines of code? Psh, I'm going to go out to dinner. You know, and you can't do that, because I sort of measure my own skill in certain things in how many Google searches to lines of code I write, and you can measure it. And there's usually, if I'm working in a new domain, it's usually three to four Google searches to one line of code. You know, I have spent an hour just looking through Stack Overflow posts, copying and pasting code until literally anything worked. And that was for one line of code. Um, I think there are actually some statistics out there from the software engineering crowd where it's like one to two hours on average per line of code produced. You cannot start it at the last minute because you're going to go down the wrong path. And this is true for papers, and this is true for anything else. If you, like, again, if you're from English or literature or history, you have a lot of experience in that. And so if you're like, I have two hours to write 500 awesome words, I can do that. You know? But this is going to be a new demand for you. This is not going to be your specialty. And so you're going to need time to have a think. You know, staring out into space and looking out your window is often the most productive thing you can do. Like, 
relax your mind, stop looking at the code, and just think through things. Um, there's a story about one of the um, Bletchley Park researchers who came up with, they had like the, uh, the outputs coming in from the crypto stuff. And Bro just apparently smoked his pipe and stared out the window for three weeks, and then smoked his pipe even more and typed for three days. And boom, he had recreated it. And he had done no visible work, but he had just sat and had to think for three weeks straight. So there is no procrastination that works unless you're very advanced, or unless you're doing something you've already done before. So I actually had a little bit of a question statement thing. Um, this is Alice for Martin, Alice Mitchell, second year guest list student. Um, so in addition to being a woman, um, I'm also a youth services student, so I have never felt comfortable going out and finding resources and finding things to be able to learn how to code. And I know that you offer a few different, like, not classes, but um, like informal workshop type classes mm -hmm. to teach people how to code and to make it more accessible. Do you think that there's a way that actual professors and professionals can do that for people? Yes. <laughs> a good teacher will acknowledge. So we talk about the reference interview for our patrons, right? A good instructor is going to do reference interviews on their students, basically. Like, so whenever I have someone coming in to me, and I get this because I facilitate weekly hack nights, I get people constantly coming in, and they're like, I want to learn Python, and I'm here. Someone told me to come here, so I'm here now, so tell me things. And it's like, I like that you're here. <laughs> well, let's back up. Uh, and it's my have two questions for them. Where are you coming from? What's your academic background? And where do you want to go? Like, what domain do you want to do? And some people are legitimately just going to say, like, someone told me to learn Python. That's all I got. Uh, that's fine. I can work with you. But once you start asking these questions, you're going to have someone who's like, well, I'm from economics, and I want to do some analysis. Like, awesome. That tells me exactly what to give you. Uh, some people are going to be like, I want to make games. It tells me exactly what to give you there. Um, the talk I gave on Thursday was <laughs> basically a call for instructors to be explicit about the information. Uh, centered activities of programming because I sort of I have a model worked out where um, it's two layers of information activity over programming activities and they inform and rely on each other and a good instructor will tell you how to Google things like the this, this learning curve stops when you are able to Google things successfully so All right I just want to read a few comments from Michael online um, so Michael is saying, sometimes a human evaluating your written work will allow logical errors to slide because they can fill the gaps to understand what you meant. A computer simply can't do that. Your code won't compile or run until the logic works. That's one way that procrastination can hamstring a programmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there's this division of syntactical versus semantic errors. And so syntax is like you've misspelled the word or your hyphenation is incorrect or whatever. Um, or like, so basically punctuation problems. You haven't used the words correctly. Uh, semantic problems are like, that's like Chomsky, like that's a legitimate sentence, it's grammatically correct, but what you just said is not a thing. Um, those are really hard, because <laughs> you can write totally syntactically correct code that executes and runs, but is insane, and does nothing of what you want it to do. Um, and there's a bunch of like really initial big step up, like trip up points that happen with students. Um, so yeah, and I think is, uh, those of you who have studied logic, like breaking down your thoughts and breaking down what you wanted to do, you have an advantage over a lot of students who are sort of the freshmen to all of this stuff. Any other questions for Elizabeth? Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys.